Hello, in this video we're going to be looking at two rules of inference. One is constructive dilemma and the other is destructive dilemma. In the previous two videos we looked at the other rules of inference and so this video is going to be completing our overview of the rules of inference. To recap what we learned in previous videos, the rules of inference are formally valid argument forms. Any argument with the same form as a rule of inference is a formally valid argument. A formally valid argument is one whose form guarantees that its conclusion necessarily follows from its premises. And so long as a formally valid argument has true premises, its conclusion will also be true. To recap what we learned in the previous videos, we uh, conjunction is the rule for inferring a conjunction from two separate propositions. And simplification is the rule for inferring a single proposition from a conjunction. Addition is the rule for inferring a disjunction from a lone proposition. And disjunctive syllogism is the rule for inferring a single, prop, a single disjunct of a disjunction from the disjunction and the denial of the other disjunct. Modus ponens is the rule for inferring the consequent of a conditional when we know that the antecedent of that conditional is true. And modus tollens is the rule for inferring that the antecedent of a conditional is false when we know that the consequent is false. Hypothetical syllogism is a rule that allows us to take two conditionals and form the, and infer a single conditional that connects the antecedent of one to the consequent of the other because these two conditionals have a term in common, have a proposition in common which is the consequent of one and the antecedent of the other. And this shows the transitive property of the material conditional. And over here, this shows, I'm showing an example of a longer version of the hypothetical syllogism which has three conditionals instead. And we can infer if P then S here because we have a third conditional which is if R then S. And we could string this along further with more conditionals and our consequent here would be the consequent of the last conditional in this string of conditionals. As long as, the cons as long as the antecedent of each new conditional was the consequent of the previous one. And now we turn to dilemmas. We have a constructive dilemma here and a destructive dilemma here. With a constructive dilemma, we begin with the conjunction of two conditionals. And then we are told that the antecedent of one of those conditionals is true. So P or R, that's the disjunction of their antecedents. And we can conclude that the consequent to one of these conditionals is true. So we're concluding the disjunction of their consequence. And with destructive dilemma, we be also begin with the conjunction of two conditionals. And here we have the disjunction of their consequence. It's saying that the consequent of one of these conditionals is false. So we can conclude the disjunction of the denial of their antecedents. So this is saying one antecedent is false or the other one is false. Saying one of the antecedents is false. Let's look at some examples. Here's an example of a constructive dilemma. If you seek knowledge, you will gain the power to improve your life. If you avoid knowledge, you will spare yourself the agony of knowing about bad things that would distress you. You will seek knowledge or avoid knowledge. Therefore, you will gain the power to improve your life or you will spare yourself the agony of knowing about bad things that would distress you. And note, this is not following exactly the same form as shown up here. Here we have the conjunction of two conditionals, and here I wrote each conditional out by itself. But we know by the rule of simplification, we know by the rule of conjunction that these two conditionals here are equivalent to their conjunction. And this is just another way to write a constructive dilemma when you're writing it out in English. 
and I've done the same thing here. I've written out each conditional separately. And here's an example of destructive dilemma. If you seek power above all else, you will quell dissent. If you follow reason, you will support freedom of thought. You will not quell dissent, or you will not support freedom of thought. Therefore, you will not seek power above all else, or you will not follow reason. And let me throw in a disclaimer here. It's possible that the premises of these, of these examples are not true. I think they're generally true. There could be exceptions. And the important thing here is that they're illustrating these forms of argument. They're illustrating the dilemmas. Let me now point out how the constructive dilemma is similar to modus ponens and the destructive dilemma is similar to modus tollens. And when you understand this, it will be even easier to remember constructive dilemma and destructive dilemma. So here in modus ponens, we have a single conditional, and we're affirming its antecedent and concluding its consequent. With constructive dilemma, we have a conjunction of conditionals. We're affirming that one of the antecedents is true, and we're concluding that one of the consequence is true. If we were to make this conditional the same as the previous one, like so, and change r here to p and s to q, then this is a constructive dilemma, which is also modus ponens. This is just modus ponens written out as a constructive dilemma. And here, this line is redundant because we only need one of the conjuncts. This is redundant because the disjunction of P is equivalent to P. And this is redundant because the disjunction of Q is equivalent to Q. But as you can see, this is just expressing modus ponens. And this is showing in a way that constructive dilemma is like an extended form of modus ponens. And let me back this up. Now over here with modus tollens, we have the conditional if p then q, and we're denying the consequent of that conditional. And, if, and so we're concluding the denial of its antecedent. Here we have the conjunction of two conditionals. And we're saying that one of their consequences is false. Here we're denying one consequent. Here we're saying, well, one of them is false. And we're concluding that one of the antecedents is false. So this is like modus tollens, except here we have more conditionals, more consequence, and more antecedents. And so just as constructive dilemma seems to be an extended form of modus ponens, destructive dilemma seems to be an extended form of modus tollens. And now let's look at a truth table and show conclusively that constructive dilemma is a valid argument form. And you can make a similar one for a destructive dilemma, but for the due to considerations of space and time, we're only going to do constructive dilemma in this video. So first of all, I wrote out the premises of constructive dilemma as a conjunction. So we, the first premise was if p then q and if r then s, and I conjoined that with the second premise p or r, and made them into a single conjunction here. And this conjunction is the antecedent of a conditional. And the consequent of that conditional is the conclusion of the argument form. And if we can show that this conditional is true for every possible combination of truth values of p, q, r, and s, that will demonstrate that this argument form is a valid argument form. And there are 16 possible combinations of truth values because we have four uh, different propositions. And so that's why we have 16 rows here. And let's start by getting all possible combinations of truth values here. We're going to begin by writing t eight times under p and then f eight times under the t's. Do that here and here. And for q, we now write t four times and f four times and repeat that under q and do the same over here. For r, we repeat t twice, and then f twice, and we repeat that whole pattern again and again and again under r. 
and do the same thing over here. And then finally for S, we just repeat TF all the way down. We do that here and here. And the first thing we're going to be looking at here is the consequent of our conditional. Because the consequent is just a single expression and we can evaluate that quicker than we can evaluate the longer conjunction on the other side. So we're going to start with that. And in any instance where this is true, we're going to know that the conditional is true without having to evaluate the antecedent of the conditional. Because a co conditional is true in every instance where its consequent is true. Remember, this is a material conditional, which is not quite the same thing as our usual if-then statement in English. Okay, so here are the truth values for Q or S. And it's false in only four instances. Here, 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 and here. Otherwise, it is true. And where it is true, we know that the conditional is true. And so there are only four lines we have to look at now to determine conclusively whether this is true all the way down or whether it's false in some place. And so let's look at this line here. Let's look at P or R first. And let's just write down the truth values for those. T and T, that's true. And T, F, though that's false. No, sorry, that's a, that is true because this is a disjunction, not a conditional. And here, it's also true because we have one true disjunct. And down here is false because both disjuncts of this disjunction are false. Okay, and since it's false here, we know that the entire conjunction is false. So, F there. And because we know that's false, we know this is true. Whenever a conditional has a true, sorry, whenever a conditional has a false antecedent and a false consequent, then the entire conditional is true. Okay, but here where this, this disjunction is true, we have to look at the other conjunct of our conjunction to know whether it's true or not. So let's begin with if R then S. Well, here that's false because the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And because that's false, we know that this conjunction is false. And that follows that this conjunction is false. And so this is true. Now here we have a true conditional. But over here we have a false conditional because that's true and that's false. So that makes this false. It makes the conjunction false. And that makes the conditional true. And down here, we R is true and S is false. That makes that conditional false, which makes this conjunction false, which makes this conjunction false, which makes the conditional true on this line. And now we can see that this conditional is true all the way down for every possible combination of truth values of P, Q, R, and S. And that demonstrates that the constructive dilemma is a valid argument form. Okay. The program is... Okay. It wasn't responding quickly enough, but here we have something that looks similar to the constructive dilemma, and here we have something that looks similar to the destructive dilemma. And the difference here is that there's now an extra conditional in the first premise of each argument. And we're looking at, now we have a disjunction of all the antecedents, all three antecedents, and here a disjunction of all three consequents. And likewise here it's three and three instead of two and two. And these are also valid argument forms. And we could use a truth table to show that these are valid, but we do not have to because 
we are going to be able to use rules of inference perhaps with the help of rules of replacement which we'll get into in, in another video or another set of videos to show that these are valid argument forms. So we're using truth tables for short argument forms and once we have those, once we have a set of those which are our rules of inference and later our rules of replacement, we'll be able to use those to demonstrate the validity of other longer argument forms. Now there are a few ways to deal with a dilemma. One way is called going between the horns and going between the horns of a dilemma. And let's look at this dilemma here and understand how we're going to address this dilemma. If Luke is right, then the last words of Jesus on the cross were, Father, unto thy hands I commend my spirit. If John is right, then the last words of Jesus on the cross were, It is finished. Luke is right or John is right. Therefore, the last words of Jesus on the cross were, Father, unto thy hands I commend my spirit, or it is finished. Now, when we go between the horns of, an, of a dilemma, what we are doing is denying or at least questioning the disjunctive premise of the dilemma. Here that is Luke is right or John is right. And we're going to question this premise here because in the Bible we also have the Gospel of Matthew which gives a different account of what Jesus' last words on the cross were. And if Matthew is right then it's not the case here that Luke is right or John is right. Also it's, it's possible that neither Luke nor John nor Matthew got it right. And so in fact there are contradictions in the Bible which undermine the reliability of the Bible so we can't be sure that any particular book in the Bible is correct. So we cannot ascertain for sure that this premise is true. Another way to deal with a dilemma is called grabbing the horns of the dilemma. And we'll try it with this dilemma here. If atheists, ex sorry, if God exists, atheists will not go to heaven. If God does not exist, atheists will not go to heaven. God exists or God does not exist. Therefore, atheists will not go to heaven. Now we can't really go between the horns of this dilemma because here the disjunctive premise is just the disjunction of one statement and its denial. And that's taut tautologically true. But we can question or deny one of the premises here, one of the conditionals that are in the, dis in the conjunctive premise. I'll, before I move on, let me also note that this conclusion here is just a single proposition instead of the disjunction. And that's because here and here, the consequent of each of our conditionals is the same. So the disjunction of the consequent of the, each conditional is the same as just the consequent of either one of them. So when we grab the horns of a dilemma, we are questioning one of the conditionals. And here we're going to question this one. If God exists, atheists will not go to heaven. According to um, one school in Christianity called Universalism, God loves everyone so much that everyone will eventually get to go to heaven. Even atheists, even people who do not believe in God, will go to heaven according to universalism. And this idea makes more sense to me than the idea that unbelievers will be sent to burn in hell forever because it fits better with the idea of a just and loving God as I understand those concepts. So I would seriously call into question this premise here, if God exists, atheists will not go to heaven. And one last way to deal with a dilemma is to come up with a counter dilemma. Here's a dilemma for which I will come up with a counter dilemma. If you eat meat, you will contribute to the killing of animals. If you don't eat meat, you will risk poor nutrition. You either eat meat or don't eat meat. Therefore, you will contribute to the killing of animals or you will risk poor nutrition. Well, that sounds bad. Whichever you do, whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, um, 
there are bad consequences here. And that, that's, that seems to put you into a dilemma, as we normally understand the term. Well, one way to deal with this dilemma is to come up with the counter dilemma. And a counter dilemma is a dilemma that uses whose conditionals use the same antecedents, but the consequence reflect different s side of the issue than the first dilemma does. So we're going to look at a counter dilemma where the antecedents of our conditionals are the same. If you eat meat, you will increase the demand for farm animals, which benefits the species by leading to more of them being born. If you don't eat meat, you will reduce your risk of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. You either eat meat or don't eat meat. Therefore, you will increase the demand for farm animals, which benefits the species by leading to more being born, or you will reduce your risk of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. And here, we have not refuted the previous dilemma, but we have shown that there are other issues involved besides those that the original dilemma was showing to us. And here we're looking at the upside of eating meat and the upside of not eating meat. Whereas in the previous dilemma, we were looking at the downside of each of these. And thank you for watching this video. And um, let me point out that the ways of dealing with dilemmas came mainly from philosophical writing by A.P. Martinich. This is also the book that uses the same symbols as I've been using. And in the next video, we'll be looking at using the rules of inference to show that other longer argument forms are also valid.